too. Anyway, since we seem to be out of witnesses, I thought I'd drink a little. And we're on. Hey, Tyler, how's it going? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Uh, I'm pretty good. I've been working uh, out of the house today, uh, doing a few errands here, there, and there, and uh, had to come in the office for a bit to uh, deal with some real estate stuff. But good. Back in the home. It looks like you're making some work. progress at home. Your the, your bench in the back there is a little bit cleaner than it was. I just, it looks like maybe I, on, it's it's on the floor, like right here. I could show you the floor over here, but that's <laughs> also your stuff. So. <laughs> So um, what we were going to talk about, um, which relates to a few uh, tweets I made from our, uh, our Stray Law Cocktail Twitter. I thought uh, I revoked your tweeting privileges, but okay. No, no. What'd you say? Um, our phones were down for two days, as you may recall. Oh, last week, yeah. Jeez. Um, yeah. Which pissed me off rather severely. Is yeah. is that okay? Is is our our? Uh, I think piss is okay. Okay, we we had a complaint that I was throwing the f bomb around a little too uh, frequently from one of our loyal listeners, viewers, yeah, so and they're going to hear this one. So thank you. We appreciate the feedback, and here yes. we are obliging. We are not going to say the f word today. Yeah. Oh, I will. So uh, if anyone was on our website uh, Friday, uh, you would note that we uh, had to post a notification that our phone lines were down. Um, and they were down for just about two days, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and not only were they down, but our provider uh, had a message that we can't change. There was this cryptic, um, uh, the number you're calling is not available. Right. Yeah. And so, so it sounds like we've gone out of business. Or I know. Something. We, we took and, your trust money and we fled. And so That's what it so like. here's the double whammy. And so as I tweeted, we, our, our software or quasi hardware provider is 3CX, who tells themselves as, you know, an answer to uh, professionals everywhere for uh, phone service via kind of a VoIP uh, service, uh, internet based phone. Um, well, not only uh, was it not working, but when I contacted their uh, support, they were singularly useless in their response. Basically said, well, do you have a tech person that you deal with locally? I said, yeah. And they go, well, what does he tell you? And I said, well, he tells us that you've got a regional problem and it's not related to any local issue. And she said, well, that might be so you should talk to him. And so, so, you know, near as I can tell, and this will lead into our broader conversation, but near as I can tell, um, 3, 3CX kind of creates a software platform for VoIP phone systems. Allegedly, we're supposed to be able to use it wherever we're at. Uh, I don't know what your experience is like. My experience is it is uh, occasionally uh, problematic in the office. It is frequently not working properly when I use it outside the office. Have you noticed that? Do you ever use 3CX on your cell phone? Use it all the time. Love it. No problems. Serious. Ever almost. One time I had an issue and I, I talked, it was on the phone with the other lawyer and the other lawyer said, I think it's because we both use 3CX that there's some issue with the phone app to phone app or something. And so then we just phoned each other's cell phones. Because I've had but, my phone um, just cut off a conversation with the client at least three or four times. Now, now I do sit, I'll just sit still. I'm at my desk at home and I'm on my, on my app and I'm talking and I sit still and my router's right here and I'm sitting right here. So it's, okay. Mine's not bad. No, I've never, I, I've loved it. No problem. The only thing that kills me is we paid a boatload of money for these physical phones and I never use them. I just use the app. So I don't, anyway, that's my only question. Yeah, whereas I, I don't trust the app on my phone, my experience. So I use the physical phone, but, but the problem is um, if a whole portion of the country is down who uses 3CX, 
you would think that their support network would be curious or would know this, but it's like, we don't care. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, I kind of went, and, 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 and it leads to the broader issue of, if someone asked me, would you get a 3CX phone program? I'd say no, not a billion years. Oh, wow. Now we're kind of stuck with it, although we are looking at alternative providers right now. We are? We are. <laughs> we are. You just make the decisions. All I'm here for the ride. Oh, this was Alan. Uh, when I talked All to him. Our on, business partner, Alan. Yeah. So, All right. but, it, but it led to a, a broader discussion about um, the pros and cons of technology in a law office and what they provide and what they don't provide and whether they meet the, uh, you know, the promises that technology offered. Um, and I think in a great many respects, technology has really failed to provide a tangible benefit to our clients or to ourselves as professionals. Um, other than, you know, there is convenience. Doing research online is abundantly uh, quicker than it used to be when you had to go to a library and pull out reports and copy cases and so forth. But there was something sort of nostalgic about that. But the question is, uh, clients getting better service cheaper because of technology. Start with that. Go. Are, oh, uh, no. The clients do not, well, hmm, that's a good one. Maybe in some respects. Generally, I wouldn't say that they're going to get cheaper service. Uh, technology costs money. Yep. And uh, the way that law works, you know, at least litigation, the way that our litigation works is you got to pay your lawyer for the time he puts in or she. And so, so it doesn't matter if I'm writing an email, I guess, or a letter. Uh, I'm going to charge the time that it took me to write it. And I guess, you know, there was at some point lawyers writing letters and then at some point they're dictating them and someone's typing them. And then that I think is expensive for the lawyer themselves. They're not going to be as profitable because now they're paying staff to, to write something or type something or whatever that they just dictate it. Uh, whereas I can type an email just as fast as I can dictate a letter that someone yeah. else is going to type. So, so things like that, I would say, okay, you might get quicker service. You might get some better service. You're going to get a quicker response. You know, you're not going to be waiting two or three days for this turnaround and me to dictate and then someone to type and get it to another lawyer's office physically and send it back and forth or fax it or whatever. So you might, things might move a little faster in that respect. So you might get some better service, but it's not cheaper. I've still got a bill for the time that I put in because that's, I guess how our industry works, at least right now. And, and although we have some other options, flat fee options yeah. for some things, generally speaking, they're not going to get it cheaper. But yeah, I think they might get some better service and maybe some, some uh, yeah, something quicker, some quicker service. So how does, so when you say quicker, compared to what? Compared to letters? Yeah, so I mean, if you want to talk about correspondence simply, yeah, you might get some, you know, my correspondence turnaround is going to be quicker. That's also going to free up my staff's time to do other things for me that maybe I would normally have to do. So maybe I, I get to other things quicker. I can draft your pleadings quicker. I can um, draft settlement documents quicker. I can get back to other lawyers quicker. I can do more files at once. So, so, so here's, here's my pushback. Let's talk about the example of a certain lawyer that we know where you get the never ending I already know who you're talking about. I acknowledge receipt of the correspondence you sent me today. I got seven of those from uh, six or seven. And uh, they send you a, a letter mm -hmm. or a fax or an email on the 3rd of November. And you know, on the 7th of November or the 6th, probably you're going to get another letter saying, can I please get a response to my correspondence? And then three or four days later, they'll send another letter saying, can I get a response to my correspondence? Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's better service to that client who now has been billed for three or four letters because there's an expectation now that if I have a fax or an email in particular, um, 
I should be able to respond within 24 hours, ignoring the reality that we are frequently in court or questioning, we have busy practices. And it's not unusual to take a week to respond to a proposal or a demand that's not particularly urgent. Uh, and so in that example, I'd say, okay, the expectation of immediacy has not really improved the service to the client and it probably on some level increases their costs. The expectation of immediacy between lawyers you're talking about specifically. Yeah. But I think that's a bit of an extreme example because I think most lawyers would give me two, three days to deal with something that's somewhat urgent. If it's not urgent, they're going to give me at least a week, maybe 10 days before they're going to follow up. Um, usually I'm about two or three days behind uh, return time on my emails. Uh, sometimes it's same day. Usually by the end of the week, I can almost get to same day. And then by the time we get through a weekend and back to Monday and back to two or three days behind, and then I can try to catch up at the end of the week. But uh, yeah, so there is some expectation of immediacy. But I think as long as the, the responses back and forth actually advance some interests, as opposed to just being, where are we at? Tell me, please give me an update. What are we going to do? Uh, if it's the same thing over and over again, which I got, I got four of today from a lawyer here in town of <laughs> just nonsense, just the same, and it wasn't even an issue. And, uh, and so that can be problematic, but if it's actually advancing things and you're doing it every couple of days, you're doing seven to 10 days out or whatever it is, that is good service. Like that is better. Now I don't have much to compare it to. I've only been doing well, this for and, and so, four and years so, and I articled, so maybe Yeah, so here's years. my point is I, I graduated in 1985 and I, in, in our small city, uh, worked in a firm that was the first firm in Lethbridge to have a fax machine. <laughs> and that wasn't there when I got there. It was there a couple of years later. Um, and this was an astounding uh, uh, technology uh, now, no one else in Lethbridge had one for some time. So you'd say, what's your fax number? And you'd act all superior when they went, we don't have a fax number. Can I interrupt uh, for a second? Hold on a second. I, I've only sent maybe seven or eight faxes ever in my entire life. But isn't the whole premise behind having a fax machine, doesn't, doesn't it require somebody else to also have a fax machine? Yes, but well, good was it keep in mind that in 1986 or in 85, <laughs> There yeah. was no email. Uh -huh. So your only Who choices, is... you had three choices when you wanted to correspond. You could send a letter, ordinary mail, or you could courier. And then the fax machine came along. And instead of the 24 to 48 hours for a courier, you would have relatively instant communication with the other lawyer. Okay. Um, I still don't know who you're faxing if no one else has a fax machine. Well, I mean, over time, people got fax machines. Oh, right. But my point is, um, I, I, I worked at a time where people didn't even have computers, where secretaries, legal assistants, pardon me, uh, they used typewriters and carbon paper, right? And so the idea of doing 10 drafts of a document was was it just didn't happen because it's it would be too monumental a waste of time and effort. Um, now, I'm sure some lawyers did that, but for the most part, it was unheard of. You you made do unless there was, you know, significant errors and you had white out and shit like that. But, um, but at the end of the day, I don't think our service was appreciably different because the fundamental issues that you deal with, you know, the fundamental approach to resolution is still outlining a position, getting your disclosure, and then formulating a revised position and trying to settle. And I don't think things settle appreciably faster now than they did 30 years ago. You know, I'm but, reflecting a little bit on what you said earlier, and there is quite a bit of nonsense that can go back and forth, you know, especially petty stuff that, you know, maybe back when you were writing letters, no one's going to say, hey, he's late for pickup. It's two o'clock. He hasn't got the kids yet. Is he going to show up or not? Can you call their lawyer? 
And then, okay, I, Tyler gets it, but he emails, and you wouldn't have been able to do that back then. So all of a sudden, there's this added expense for these little things that yeah. maybe wouldn't have been there before. It, so there is some nonsense that goes along with it. So there's that. So there's, I think there's more waste, right? Because yeah, it's easier yeah, way to, put it. to send an email. It's, you, you can throw this stuff out there like it's confetti. And, and not only that, but the clients email us, right? And some clients email constantly and they get billed for us reading emails and they get billed when we respond. Um, but my sense is, and I'm trying to change this in the last year or so, we have less telephone contact with our clients. We have less, particularly with COVID, personal contact with our clients. And so our relationships have become more digital in the sense of email going back and forth between us and our clients. And I, and I wonder sometimes about whether that has made our relationships less personal with our clients than they would have been uh, 30 years ago. Mm. Right? So if the only way you could really communicate with the client, because clients never sent letters in the day. So there's only really two courses of communication with your client. They were by telephone calls or by direct meetings face to face. And both of those have a certain intimacy that you don't get with email. Don't you think? Sometimes I do require those because we need to have a serious conversation or we need to be face to face. We really got to deal with something. And there is, yeah, there is something about being face to face that can make that. I don't know what it is, but there is something about that. If I got to break bad news or if I got to, yeah. if I got to, kind of lean on you a little bit to get some reality into your mind that what you want is not what's really going to happen. Or yeah. if, that, if it's a difficult conversation, sometimes that is easier to do in person. Or if it's, we really got to get down and crunch some numbers about benefit and risk and, and expense, sometimes too, it's too complicated to try and do in a setting like this or over a phone. So at some of that time, I do like to do that in person and that is important. But on the other hand, man, is it easy just to send that message in an email, get that instruction back. And not only is that quick and kind of efficient, but now I've got a record of it. I can look back and say, yep, I told you this, you told me that. Um, so that covers my butt. You're not going to sue me for something later, uh, which is unfortunately a big part of the lawyer's practice is make sure we don't get sued, that we're diligent, that we're doing a good job for you. Yeah. There's good and bad that comes with that. Uh, and, but there's also something kind of efficient about that, that I can just look back and see what did we talk about last and what is the instruction and what's the current situation, right? I just did that today. You know, I get an email from the other lawyer and, and that lawyer says, no, no, you're way off. That never happened. And I look back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nope. That's exactly. Here's the evidence. Here's the client sent me these messages, whatever. Right. So, I, you know, yeah, it's, there's some good and bad. There's some good and bad. I like it. Uh, I like technology. I rely on it. I mean, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I well, enjoy office, technology, yeah. um, but I've become uh, a technology skeptic, right? I mean, some of what, a good example is we, we had a guy at our old office trying to sell us uh, dictation software, right? Yeah. And I remember sitting in the office and he was showing us this shit and he was saying, you know, you just talk into your microphone and your document sort of just starts going and, and then you say print and it prints it or send the email and off it goes, right? And he said, so, you know, you don't have to print it out and put it in a, a, an envelope and send it. And, and this is just so much better. And I said, well, how is this better? And he looked at me like, excuse me? And I go, well... <laughs> You know, I, I bill a client for sending a letter, right? Um, if I can do that faster, arguably I make less money. Okay, all right, yeah, I see that side so of it. I said, but let's assume that, you know, because what we do is we generally, for short letters, you know, they're 0.1 or 0.2, depending, you know, we bill in tenths of an hour. So ignoring that, um, I'm, I'm still going to bill the same amount, even though it, it is somewhat quicker and somewhat more efficient. Um, but now I'm paying for some piece of software that I get to add to my overhead 
so the perceived benefit of that to the client is marginal. The perceived addition to my overhead is very real, you know, and then that leads, you know, back to this issue of well, what's the net benefit for the client. And, and one of the things I looked at is the cost of legal services. And I looked at this stat uh, and it was in the U S but um, it has significantly outpaced inflation uh, mm. in the last 20 or 30 years. It just has. That's the cost of that's legal expenses. Yeah. So since between okay. 1986, when I got called to the bar in 2020, <clears throat> Uh, the inflation rate of legal services in the United States increased by 3.91% per year. Oh, wow. So the legal services in 1986 that would have cost 10,000 are now 36,859.57. Right. Meanwhile, though, the overall inflation rate has only gone up 2.55%. Jeez. So, so not only have we had vastly increased use of technology, which adds to our overhead, but we've seen uh, increase in the cost to the clients of our service, not a decrease over that period. And while our incomes have increased, and again, I, you know, I have some sense what lawyers were making in 1986 uh, compared to now. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, uh, if the costs have gone from 10,000 to 36, that's 3.6 times, you know, uh, the cost, um, if a lawyer, a good lawyer in Lethbridge back in 86 might've been making 100 to 120,000 a year, a, a highly skilled senior counsel. Okay. On average, they're not making 400 and some thousand dollars a year in Lethbridge. Okay. So the point is client <clears throat> costs have gone up. Uh, lawyer salaries have not gone up to the same extent, probably uh, somewhat in line with inflation, but we're spending way more money on the bells and whistles in our office without okay. question. And this comes yeah, from a yeah. guy that when I started my own office in 1993, <clears throat> lawyers never had computers on their desks. And when I told my partner, Perry McDonald, I need a computer on my desk because I was a tech fiend. And he looked at me like, what are you nuts? For what? <laughs> Right. And so I, I was in, in our city, one of the innovators, and I'm still on some level an innovator because our practice is digital or most lawyers, digital practice is still not a thing. So yeah. I'm not afraid of technology. I embrace it. But now I'm starting to go, I'm not sure what the net benefit is. There's okay. a lot of people making money uh, of, out of lawyers and their clients, right? Accounting software providers. Now the Law Society of Alberta mandates that we have uh, online uh, ability to yeah. transmit our trust data, which means we need to pay significant money for our accounting software. Um, and it is, like, it's a big amount. That is a lot of money we spend on, yeah. on that software. Yeah, it is. So anyway. And that's not just it, right? There's client management software, there's document production, there's you know, even just our outlook, our file storage in yeah. the cloud that, you know, it's, there's a lot to it yeah. for sure. And, we spend and, a lot of money on that. You know, and, and what are we, we're running OneDrive and SharePoint for our online documents storage. Yeah. And how often does it not work properly? Pretty regularly. Pretty regularly. We got right? issues. And you, know. you got to shut it down and reinstall and, you know, yep. correct errors. It happens with frequency in a small firm yeah. with three or four lawyers. We don't have full-time <clears throat> IT staff, but even if you did, okay, well, here's a guy you're going to pay sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year to to do nothing but keep your shitty software running the way you hope it would. Back in the day, we had IBM Selectric typewriters <laughs> that took very little maintenance, um, and that was it. Your technology was your lights and a phone and maybe a dictaphone that you recorded things in, right? Um, so our overhead was uh, our assistance and keeping the lights on. And I don't know what a percentage is. I would bet 10% of our overhead is technology on some level. Yeah, I, it could be more. Yeah, it wouldn't be and less than 10%. And, and computers <clears throat> and software and accounting, right? Yeah. 
Well, our Zoom, I mean, everything, every little thing. Yeah, our Zoom subscriptions were on right now. Um, yeah, I got a pair of these and we've got, I've got offices all over the place and all my offices, I got these. I've got to have some sort camera of- Camera right there. I got to have a camera, which I'm holding. I got to have some sort of mic. I've got to have something to scan. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to it, yeah. yeah. But so, on top, but I mean, but it's a good thing we do. I, I like it. I think it's a good thing we do, right? We are just cutting edge as far as the, the way people operate a law firm goes, in my opinion. I'm, I maybe I'm biased, but, you know, I mean, I, I've got other young lawyer friends who've said to me, well, I can't conduct questioning uh, uh, over Zoom uh, because what? how do I show a document? Or what about entering an exhibit? Or what if they can't hear me? Or it's like, okay, that's... At least we're on top of that kind of stuff. And not only that, but now, of course, I can work anywhere. And so can you. So, you know, we get COVID or we get a little sniffle and we got to isolate. Not a problem. I, I can do it. I can work from my bed. Uh, you know, I had surgery and my tonsils out. And uh, there I am sitting in bed trying to keep up a little bit with emails and see what's going on. And uh, I can do it from there. I can do it from my home office here, uh, the office down the hallway hopefully uh, soon again, Maui, I mean, yeah, you know, and there's a and, benefit. And you're right. Like I started this because I was a bencher at the Lost Society of Alberta and I was spending days and days away from the office. Right. Um, yeah. In hotels and airports. I was on various committees and I was traveling uh, around Canada uh, to some degree and having the capacity to pull up my files uh, in an airport on my iPad was really helpful. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not eschewing, is that a word? Eschewing uh, technology. Right. But I think it's been oversold. You know, I think the promise of technology has made a lot of money for tech industry under the pretense of providing incredible benefits to society and particularly to the legal profession. And I just don't think it's panned out. I think you're right that, a, the, you know, a file start to finish bird's eye view would not be that different to take that much longer if we were to not have the tech we've got. If we're gonna write letters back and forth, send proposals. There's something that's sort of valuable about that that maybe forces you to get to the point it forces so, you to move forward and proceed as opposed to saying, you know, pointless emails or emails that have only little value, right? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. what this leads me to is, you know, and it gets back to this 3CX bullshit. Um, is there a benefit to 3CX versus what used to be your, uh, what we call landline system? I wish I knew the difference. I don't really know. I there think isn't. there's some benefit. There isn't. I guarantee you there is not, right? I like that people can, that somebody can answer a phone and transfer it to my cell phone. I like that. Yeah, but nobody does that in our office. Almost never. They should be. Do I need to no. go up there? <laughs> but they don't. Oh, no, they should be. I want, and, yeah. and they could just as easily send you an email saying, can you phone so-and-so, and, and, which is more often than not what happens for me. Or I get a text okay. from you or somebody. Um, mm -hmm. But the 3CX platform, uh, to me, is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, yeah, I, I can point and click with my computer, in theory, and just talk through my microphone to a client while I'm working. But I don't, right? I'll either pick up the phone if I'm in the office, or I'll use my cell phone. Um, so what... So what I think as a profession, we need to look more skeptically at technology as a benefit to ourselves and our clients. Um, and we need to move more cautiously, even though we have a digital office and we work part-time from home because of those benefits. Um, we need to be a little more skeptical about this stuff. And if I had to do it again, and I'm just going to throw this out there for anyone who's thinking about a VoIP system, don't get 3CX, get a hard line, tell us, Bell, whatever your providers are in your local area. And you're probably gonna get more dependable service. And at least when you have a problem, your provider is there. And you're not online with somebody from Czechoslovakia or who knows where. 
reading from a manual and then basically telling me, well, there's nothing I can do. It's not my problem, which is what we got from 3CX. So again, 3CX, piece of crap. Don't buy it. Avoid them like the plague. Um, uh, but our technology, be a little skeptical. Be, uh, I think, a little more circumspect about throwing money uh, at increased technology that your clients may prefer actually seeing you sitting in your office or getting a phone call over the expedited online portals that all these software providers are touting. Just my thought. All right. I would agree with most of what you said. I think that uh, the, the clients might appreciate uh, something other than email on occasion, but not necessarily all the time. And I think email has its place for what it is. Um, I don't know about the phone. I like that people can transfer a call to my cell phone. So I don't know what that takes. I don't know what VoIP is. I don't really know how that works, but do I like that. Um, so but worth I, but what we're be... paying for it. Is the benefit so outstanding that it's worth the money? I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm not uh, too keen on looking at exactly how much we pay for different things. I just want to have fun. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, but, but there are things to be skeptical about for sure, right? I think what you hit on, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about these uh, like voice software things dictating yeah. text and stuff like that. I don't see. I can type as fast as I can talk. What's the difference? What's the benefit there? I, I don't think that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, I don't know. What else doesn't make sense? But you know, there is a benefit to having digital files. I think that's huge, being able to keep a digital file with everything you've got. Yeah. So whether that means you have to scan physical stuff or, or save emails or whatever, like, and to be organized in that fashion makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm not saying I want three foot thick, 15 pound files like in the old days that you have and some 10 years of storage still. that you have to, you know, uh, I love the fact that all my ed dead files are right here in the cloud. Yeah, and you I know can, what I, I can open a file. I just had a client meeting this afternoon with the client who I closed her file two years ago and I can open her file from my home office. Every document, yeah. every letter, it's right there. Yeah. And I can say, well, this is what his financial statement said in 2017 and this is what we're looking at if you want to review support. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, no question there's good technology and we shouldn't be afraid of it. We don't want to be Luddites. Right. But before you jump into buying certain <clears throat> technology, you really, I think, have to be a little bit cautious about the cost benefit of some of it. And think about it from not just your perspective, but maybe the staff's perspective, the client's perspective. What does that look like practically? And, yeah. and, and what does it cost to everybody? And what's the benefit to everybody? Yeah, yeah, that is, that's good advice. So we've been going on over a half hour. That's our spiel, I think, for today. Right on. Uh, we're a little bit late. We were going to do this Friday, and then Tyler had a headache, and I was supposed to get back to him Saturday, and then got busy. And Saturday was Halloween or something, so we were having fun. And... Oh, yeah, yeah, and you've got two little kids, and I was giving out chocolate bars to the local neighbors and their kids. and yeah. Full-size chocolate bars, by the way. Which what? irritated Marcy, but I would have stopped by. I didn't know. Yep. And we gave away about 20 and I think I've got 40 or 50 left. And I gave a box to my daughter. I still might stop by. I still, you know, we still have probably 10 or 20 chocolate bars in the house, which my two year old still says every day. He still says, can I, I want to go trick or treating, trick or treat Halloween, please. So I'll dress him up. We'll come over. I seem to remember my brother Halloweening not on Halloween. <laughs> I seem to remember my little brother putting on a costume and going door to door sometime in like, you know, June or some shit. Why do we only do that once a year? That's not fair, poor kids. I know, it should be a regular thing. All right, well, I'm bringing my son to your house for some full-size chocolate bars. There you go, but, you know, then you're expanding your COVID bubble. Uh, he's got a mask and we've got masks, which I, from oh yeah, we should have wore those. Like, I should have brought that home. 
on Halloween night. I didn't think about it. I meant to, and I forgot. I was kicking myself. We've got some very COVID friendly, uh, fun masks for our office. So yeah. yeah. Deadpool, Spider-Man and Iron Man. Yeah. Iron Man's probably not COVID compliant. It's plastic. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to spit at you, it's going to be it's still going to be something. It's going to be better than nothing. True. Yeah. True. But the Deadpool and the Spider-Man are full mesh. You're definitely not spitting through that. No, you'd really have yeah. to make some effort. <laughs> all right. Well, it was good to see you all. Uh, cheers. Yeah. My drink is gone, but. No, I didn't ask. I had a gin and tonic today. Oh, okay. All right. I don't even remember what I had. It was something with whiskey. I don't know. Yeah, I stopped in Costco and got two liters of gin on the weekend. <laughs> all right. Good. All right. Well, we'll call it a day and uh, we'll be back. Uh, I don't know. We're going to do one Friday again or? We should. Yeah. Let's do something Friday. I'm not sure what we'll talk about. If you have ideas or thoughts, uh, all of our subscribers, um, we again, we'll have a, uh, there'll be a subscribe up here at the end of our podcast. Subscribe and uh, give us your thoughts and ideas. And if you want me to say, don't say it. Less. The F word. Let me know. I'm not saying I'm going to do it. Chances are pretty good that it's going to leak out. But we'll take your advice and your <laughs> requests and we'll go with it. So, ciao. Till next time. See y'all later.